if uh, you have ever taken pictures using a, a traditional, you know, camera, like a 35-millimeter camera, I know everything's automatic today, but there was a time at least when, uh, when you went to take the picture, the first thing you had to do was when you had the person or whatever you were taking a picture of in sight, you had to adjust the lens, right? To bring the object into clear focus so that the end product would be clear. And nothing worse than a picture that's all fuzzy and blurry, right? Just throw that in the trash. Um, and then, you know, if, you see, if the scene changes, you know, and uh, say you go from inside to outside, so you got lighting differences, when you go to take the picture again, you've got to do the same thing. You've got to bring it into clear focus so that you get a good picture. <clears throat> That's what I want to do today. I don't want to take your picture or anything like that. But I want to bring something into clear focus for you and for me as the church. I wanted to bring in clear focus the mission of the church. A lot has happened, obviously, in our congregation um, in the last year, even. Uh, we sold our church building. Uh, that's a huge deal, right? That was hard. It wasn't easy. But we thought it was best, and, and, and we did. And everything closed, and we moved out uh, last February. And we moved into here. And we have been meeting here ever since, and every single week, you know, we set up chairs, and set up the platform, and do everything that we need to do so we can have church. So a lot of changes have taken place in the church, and uh, in addition to that, you know, things have taken place in your life. There have been changes. Uh, there's been changes in our country. Everywhere you look, there have been changes. And, uh, and because of that, I think it's important that we take some time and refocus and bring into clear focus what we're all about, what the mission of the church is. Now, I've, uh, I've spoken on this in one way or the other all throughout the years. It wasn't too long ago either that I, that I did. Um, but like I said, due, all, due to all the change, we've, I want to refocus and, and clarify what the mission is for the Church of Jesus Christ. And we're just one church among gazillions of churches of Jesus Christ. But you know, when it comes right down to it, we all have the same fundamental mission. And it's a mission that Jesus Christ himself has given to the church. And uh, you probably know where I'm going, right? Matthew, right? Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Very familiar passage, but Jesus is very clear about what he wants his church to be doing in the world. Then and now. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there to Matthew 28, 16 through 30. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. The scene... The last scene in the book of Matthew is a, a very uh, powerful and captivating scene. You have 
the risen Christ approaching 11 disciples. Judas was gone, obviously, and hadn't been replaced yet. But here you have the risen king, and, uh, and, and you have 11 disciples. And the 11 disciples are probably on their faces, on their knees, and they're worshiping Jesus. Some doubted, but they all worshiped. Our worship is never perfect. Then, in the presence of Jesus, or today. But they were in the presence of directed God-man. Jesus Christ. And he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he issues his, his commission, his mission to the church. All authority in heaven and in earth. In the fall, or at the fall in the garden, when Adam, Adam and Eve were told to go, right, and multiply and take dominion. Well, that didn't last very long. And they fell. They fell to the temptation that Satan made to them. And they sinned against God. And at that point, Satan became the prince of the world. John uses that expression several times in his gospel. And of course, the evidence of Satan's uh, being the prince of the world is seen throughout the Old Testament. And then he comes face to face with Jesus Christ, the second Adam in the desert. Remember that? And uh, Satan's aim in the desert is to derail Jesus Christ from getting to the cross to provide salvation for all of God's people. And there are three temptations. Do you remember the, the last temptation, the third temptation that, that Satan offered? He said, Jesus, if um, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world if you will only bow down and worship me. That was a bona fide offer because he was the prince of the world. He was under the sovereignty and authority of God, but he had a role. He had rule as the prince of the world. Uh, Ephesians talks about him being the, the, the prince of the power of the air. Well, skedaddles out of the desert because Christ was triumphant. He was successful at defeating him. And then comes the cross. Satan has tried to derail him, but Christ makes it. And Jesus Christ, the God-man, your representative and mine, goes to the cross and he's crucified, he's put to death. And three days later, he rises again victoriously victorious over sin, our penalty has been paid, victorious over death, he conquered it so that we can have life and life eternal. And he conquered the evil one. What does Paul say in, in Colossians chapter 2? The powers and the authorities of disarmed, put to shame, Christ triumphed over them. And so, all these days later, after that great triumph, he comes to his disciples and he says, all authority has been given to me now as the Son of God, the Lord of heaven, and as the Lord of earth, being the Son of man. What a scene where he was a speaking to his disciples who were to take his message and disciple all the nations of the world. But it all started with his authority. And they were to go and do the work that he'd given them to do. What did he give them to do? What was the mission? 
that Jesus gave those 11 men to do and every disciple after them. And there have been myriads of disciples, right? Ever since those, the original 11 disciples there and then the 12 that was added to Acts. What were they to do? And then all the disciples since then, including you and me, because of their faithfulness and the faithfulness of many, many others after them, today, you are disciples of Jesus Christ. Abner Creek is full of disciples of Jesus Christ. What is the mission? The mission hasn't fundamentally changed even though we're 2,000 years separated from the time they were actually Jesus. Well, quite simply, okay, are you ready? It's to make disciples. That's the fundamental of the Church of Jesus Christ. It's not politics. It's not social reform. It's not any of that that have, you know, levels of importance. The job and duty of the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, that he gave his life for, we're having audio difficulty, I'm sorry about that, is to make disciples. That's what you are, right, if you're a Christian. Do you know what a disciple is? Well, a disciple, first of all, is a student, a learner. A student in the school of Christ. Calvin used that expression of the church, the school of Christ. And you matriculated into the school and took your place in, at the desk, so to speak, when you came to faith in Christ. That's true of those of you who didn't grow up in the covenant community. Those of you who did grow up in the covenant community. You matriculated by faith into the school of Christ when you were united to him by faith. And as a student, what do students do? They learn. And Jesus has a whole lot to teach his disciples, which we find in scripture, right? We're to learn everything that he's commanded. We're, we're to learn to observe everything that Christ has commanded. So a disciple is a student, someone to learn everything that Christ has commanded in, this, in all of Scripture. A disciple is also a follower, a follower of Christ. So, in other words, all things that you learn as a student in the school of Christ with that new heart and mind that you have are things that you are to do something with. You're going to follow Jesus by following his teachings. That's how you follow him. You follow his way of life that the scriptures unfold all throughout the New Testament. So that's what a disciple is. A student in the school of Christ who is about learning all that Christ has commanded and then they are to put it into practice. They are to follow him. They are to take whatever he teaches and, and, and make it happen and apply it in their daily life, in their marriage, in their workplace, wherever, wherever we are. This is the case, and this is to be something that has taken place and is to take place all around the world. I prayed for a couple of missionaries. Uh, the Vandalans, they're over in Lithuania, and they're probably be in their upper upper 60s, and they went over about 10 years ago to do work there. And the Lord has really blessed them in uh, the work that they've done. Rebecca Carson is in Germany. And so she and, and the Vandalans and scads of others and other denominations and so on are out making disciples in those parts of the world. That is the mission of the church. The question is, if that's the mission, how do, you, how do you do it? How do you put legs on the mission that Christ has given the church so that we're faithful? 
so that disciples are made. How do we do it? Well, I think if I were to poll all of you, you could tell me. Okay, it's that familiar. But things can become muddled, you know, for lots of different reasons. So it's important to bring that into focus as well. How do you make disciples? I'm going to lay out three things. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible for us, okay? And I've got them all in, in all W's, okay? So that should make it even easier. I want to be clear. To make disciples, what's involved in making disciples is witness, walk, and worship. We are to witness of Christ to the world. We are to walk in the truth of Christ. And we are to be worshipers of the God who created us. A disciple is someone who witnesses of the truth of Jesus, who walks in the truth of Christ each day in his life, and he worships the God who made him and the God who saved them, okay? That's what we are to be about doing as a church who wants to make disciples. Number one, we've got to witness Christ to the world. As you know, and I've said this a thousand times, you know this by personal experience as well as what the t scriptures teach, every human being that, that is born into this world is born dead in their trespasses and sins. They're born sinners. They have that nature. They just do it naturally, right? And, and there's nothing they can do to change those fundamentals about who they are. There's only one person that can change a human heart and bring life to them and then enable them and give them the desire to follow after Christ and worship him and that's God. And he's given you and I a message, hasn't he? The gospel message. What does Paul say about the gospel of Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 1, verse 16? The gospel is the power of God into salvation. So the only way someone can come from, from life from being a pagan outside of Christ to being a disciple of Jesus Christ and a part of his church is through hearing the good news of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit accompanying that message and boring a hole into their heart so that they, they start to see life comes. They start to see the good news. They see their sin. They're convinced of it. And they personally believe that Jesus of Nazareth was here to live and die for their salvation. And when they turn from their sin and they trust in Jesus for salvation, they're converted. And they become disciples of Jesus Christ, students in the school of Christ, to learn all that God has for them to learn in the Scriptures, and then to follow after Him, to bring Him glory and honor as they live their lives. The only way that can happen, the only way it happened with you was because God the Holy Spirit at some point in time accompanied the good news, preached to you in your church, read to you by your mother, and one day it all began to make sense. And you did something. You repented and you trusted Christ and you were saved. That hasn't changed. That method is the only method that God authorizes to change people's hearts for his glory. It's the only thing that will do it. The gospel accompanied by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul said this about his witness. He says, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. He went all out. He went all out. It was the top priority. He gave up this, gave up that, 
in order to reach people. And you say, well, you know, that's the Apostle Paul. Well, what does he say a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. This needs to be a top priority item. This witnessing of Christ to the world needs to be a church priority as well as an individual uh, disciple priority. It's got to be on our radar screen all the time. You work with people who are outside of Christ, who are dead in their trespasses and sins. There are people all throughout the community in which we are serving who are dead in their trespasses and sin. And there's only one way for that to change. And that's God using his gospel message to reach those people. And he is called his church, you and me, this congregation of disciples, to be his agent to take the gospel. Now, if I were to assess the last forever our church, I think we did follow Jesus here, and we did go, but I think we didn't go long enough and consistently enough with the good news. It's so easy. I know when I started the church, if I didn't go out and, you know, at that time, I, we still knocked on doors. And, uh, and I'm, that wasn't easy for me, you know, knock on a door. Um, but anyway, we did it. Fortunately, I had a sidekick who went with me, and we did it together and so on. Um, Got to keep focused here because I could tell you all kinds of stories. But anyway, um, so I, I had to do that or else, you know, just board it up at, at the very beginning. The various things that we did through the years in obedience to what Jesus says here. But I think it stopped. And I think we need to go further and be more consistent in this endeavor to have the courage to love people. Okay, often it's a good thing, right? In a sincere way. Um, to blanket the life of people out in the community with love and good deeds. We can do that. We can plant seeds of love and good, de good deeds all the time. And we ought to. It's a hurting world. People need mercy. People need love and compassion. And as people who've received the compassion of Christ, we can be about being devoted to good deeds and plant all kinds of seeds. Okay? How many of you like gardening? Okay, well, we need to be gardeners of, of, of good deeds and plant a lot of them. And I'm going to need your help to figure out what that looks like, what kind of seeds to plant, what kind of works to do, okay? And then we pray and look for opportunity from that to speak the good news. So that's the first major thing that God calls us to do to make disciples. The second, another W, we've got to walk in the truth with Christ. We've got to walk together in the truth with Christ. Christ says, go out and teach people to observe whatever I have commanded. Notice the observe. It wasn't just information that they were to be given. That certainly is a lot of information, that, good information, but it meant to just be packed up in here and carted around and, you know, to impress people, take a good exam and ace it or anything like that. No, it was designed, the truth of God is designed to change life, right? To conform us to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. It is something, I apologize for this thing, the truth of Christ is something that, that we are to walk out, to walk in, to live out. Something that we are to do together. Okay? It's not a solo walk. Every now and then it's good to go out for a walk, right? And you're by yourself and you can get your thoughts together. Maybe you have a, a big decision to make. That's all good and well. Nothing wrong with that, obviously. The Christian life, I mean, it's good. You have an individual responsibility to walk in the truth. You're to discipline yourself to godliness and all that jazz. But the New Testament picture, really a strong and consistent picture, is one where the disciples of Jesus Christ walk together in the truth. They help each other walk in the truth. Uh, we all need that help. 
we need that encouragement. Sometimes it's really, really hard to do the right thing, to walk in the ways of Christ. I don't want to forgive her. She hurt me. I don't want to forgive him. I don't want to stay. I don't want to do the right thing. And so we need, hey, let's sit down and talk here. And you sit down and talk with that person struggling and you listen, you pray, and then you encourage saying, brother, look what Jesus says here. Our Lord, our Master's, you know, one who has all authority says, this is what you need to do. You need to go and make things right. Okay, okay. I'll pray for you. When you've done this, call me back. Okay? And uh, so let's do it. So we need one another in this. We walk together as disciples, becoming more and more like Jesus until the day that he parts the sky to come get us. Um, we have the unique privilege of helping each other grow to become more like Jesus Christ. We were created in the image of God. Christ is about redeeming you as the image bearer of God so that you increasingly, more clearly, and more fully reflect the glory of God in your daily life. You can help each other do that. We won't get into all, uh, there's a lot more to say about that, but I can't, I don't have time to do it. So that's the second big thing that we got to do that's involved in making disciples. And all of that leads to the final task, the task of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, fulfilling what we were originally created to do. We were created to worship, to worship God. When God saves a person through, say, your obedience and telling the gospel and they come to faith, the ultimate reason why God saves is so that he will save a person who will become a worshiper. Jesus says as much in, in John chapter 4. Listen to what he says. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Listen to this. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What God is doing throughout the world is seeking worshipers. So when someone is saved out of the world and they're made alive and they're converted, and they're become, they become God's children and disciples, they were, God did all that so he would have someone who would worship him. And then as we grow and change as disciples, we can worship him better and better and better because we more fully reflect his likeness and his glory. This is the bottom line. Our original sort of byline was to the praise of God's glorious grace. That's been with us for 27 years, and obviously before that it was, it's been in the Bible and in, in the book of Ephesians. Um, we're to do everything that we do to the praise of God's glorious grace. And notice we don't have that you know, spelled out here in, in uh, Matthew 28. Christ doesn't say, go and worship me. What do you have? You have the disciples who had been with Jesus all those years in the presence of, you know, one who had just, who had risen from the grave. And what do they do? They do what they were created and saved to do. They bowed down and they worshiped and adored Jesus Christ. That's the end point. One day, missions and evangelism and witness will be done. One day you will be fully adult as Christ. That'll be done. The one thing that will go on for all eternity is the worship of God. There are a couple of important attitudes to have as we conclude the sermon this morning. One is submission. I've tried to be faithful to what the text said. So it's Jesus Christ speaking through his word. The same one who stood before the eleven 
stands before us spiritually and he says, you need to go. You need to be willing to submit to me in every area of life. There are people that you know that sti still need to hear. There are believers that you need to walk beside to help grow and change. And we all need to maintain that Godward focus of worship and praise. So submission is the first attitude. The king has spoken, not me, but Jesus. And the, the proper response is one of submission and one of hope. What does he say? He issues all the, he issues his commission and so on. And then at the very end, he says, go and I will be with you always until the very end of the age. So we don't go alone. This is Jesus' mission. And he is with us as we go, as we live our lives from day to day, as we walk as disciples, as we minister the good news. Good news. He is with us. He's the one that makes it effective. It isn't me, for sure. It isn't any of us, no matter how well we do something. Ultimately, what makes the disciple-making ministry effective is the king and head of the church. He's the one that saves. He's the one that changes. All for his glory and honor. <clears throat> I have made something that looks like this. And I'm going to ask uh, Brian, not Brian, but uh, Steve and Dennis to give you a copy. Um, and I want to quickly walk through it as a conclusion, okay? And I think we have it to go up on the, on the board as well. Um, we'll talk further about this. I've only got a couple minutes because I can't take all of AJ's time here. Um, but it's two pages. Page one looks like that. It's the mission of the church. Making and being disciples of Christ who honor God in all of life. That's a good way, I think, to capture the essence of what Jesus is saying. We're to make disciples and we're to be disciples in order to honor God in all of life. Next page. Okay. Here you have a disciple-making strategy. You have the task of the mission which I just talked about. Christian witness, Christian walk, Christian worship. Under Christian witness, witness together in the, to the world of Christ in deed and word. Christian walk, walk together with Christ in the word. And then Christian worship, worship God together in spirit and in truth. Underneath that you have how we carry it out, the ministries of the church. Um, as far as Christian witness, now, let me just say, we've got a lot of work to do to flesh this out. These are just, this is me framing things for you, bringing it into clear focus, but there's work to be done to, to, to detail it out. Ministries, community service, grief share, sharing the gospel. Under the Christian walk, Sunday core classes, AJ's class, for example, trying to develop some core teachings that every disciple needs to know. Community groups, begin in a couple weeks. In core classes, fundamentally, we're there to learn. In community groups, which I'll lay out in a couple weeks, we're there to grow. And then counseling, solving problems, because we get stuck. Uh, I can't grow, I'm stuck here. Well. Counseling is where you come in and you try to solve that problem so that the disciple can get going down the road of discipleship. And then you have Christian worship. You've got the corporate worship services and any special services that we might do, Easter, Christmas, etc. Now underneath that, like I said, we can't do any of this without provision from God. And he has provided the means of grace to us, Okay or as I call, grace for ministry. Under a Christian witness, we have the resources of the gospel, of fellowship, and of prayer. Those are fundamental things that enable us to carry out our witness. Okay? How about our walk? Well, the 
What are the resources for that? The Word, fellowship, and prayer. And then how about our Christian worship? You got the Word, sacraments, prayer, and praise. Okay? So that's the very basics. A lot of details, but there you have framed for you the ministry of the church. Making disciples. This is how we do it. Through ministries depending upon the means of grace that God has given to us for the mission. All right? Um, in a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll preach on something related to this next week, and then two weeks from now, we'll gather, and I want you to give some thought to what I've said and, and what it looks like here. That way we can start some planning, okay, because we've got work to do. We are in the process of buying land. That's stage one. Stage two is clarifying and framing our ministry so that we know what we're doing and where we're going. And uh, so I'm going to be working between now and the end of the year to, to try to get all of us on the same page, okay? Moving in this direction, all with something to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We praise you and thank you for your provision. Pray that you'll help us, uh, that we do this in your name, with your power, according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll give you about...